Okay. So 6.7 is all about moments and centers of mass. Okay. And so another word that you might have heard for centers of mass is a centroid. Okay, so centroid is another word for centers of mass. Uh, and like we've been doing all summer, let's go ahead and start with a what we know and what's new. Okay, so we have the same picture on both sides. That's not a typo. All right, but we're going to take a look at both pictures and just kind of build on our knowledge of integrals and apply them to a new situation. So if I wanted to write an integral that represented the area for the left hand uh, table, what would that integral be? The integral of f of x minus g of x with your bounds being from a to b. All right, f of x minus g of x, and it goes from a to b. Very good. All right, so we've got our top curve and we've got our bottom curve, right? So that part doesn't change. And then we need a starting point and an ending point, which they have so kindly given us as A and B, okay? So if we had the functions and we plug them in and we integrated, we would get the area, the amount of space that is between those two curves from A to B, okay? So what we're going to be thinking about now is, yes, we can find the total area, but can we find the center of the shape? Okay, so we're looking to find the center. That's not how you spell center. The center of your The center of your region okay so if we were thinking about like guessing where the center is I don't think anyone would guess over here right that's that's clearly not in the center of things or like something over in this corner is probably not in the center um, but where where could we maybe put this X to measure or to mark off the center of this shape would it be um a plus B divided by two, or are we looking at the center of the volume, like center mass? Not talking about volume, we're talking about area. It's a two-dimensional situation, okay? So is it the distance from A to B's um, center, or is it the center of the area? It's the center of the region, the area. Would it be where the distance between f of x and g of x is greatest? Why would it be where it's the greatest? Uh, I'm just thinking like if you have like the center of a circle and you need the center of that area, mm -hmm. wherever it's big, but this, I don't know, shot in the dark. Okay. All right, so I've heard a couple ideas here. Maybe it's like half of the, between the distance of a and b, maybe it's the, largest f of x minus g of x, okay? So, you know, if we had a shape, like a more regular shape, like a circle or a rectangle, um, we could probably eyeball the middle. But when we get to sort of more complex shapes like this, it's a little bit harder to kind of guess because let me get rid of these x's here. We have like this part of the shape is very different in size from this part of the shape, right? So do we think our center or our centroid is closer to A or closer to B? B. Okay, so we think it's probably a little bit closer to B. And do we think it's closer to F of X or G of X? Uh, f of x. And what makes you say that? Because the concavity. Okay. 
Any other thoughts about whether it's going to be closer to f of x or g of x? Uh, g of x. Okay, and what's your reasoning? Because the area is bigger down there. Hmm. Okay. All right, so th that's what we're going to kind of figure out today, okay? And we're going to approach this with sort of an overall process and include some new vocabulary about different parts of the function, okay? All right, so to find the centroid, we need to know the mass of the plate as well as the moments of the region. And so let's talk about what those things are, okay? So we're gonna start off by finding the mass of the plate. Okay, so to find the mass of the plate, and we're gonna call this capital M, okay? So capital M stands for the mass of the plate. Now, the way we get mass is we're going to take, we're going to take density and we're going to multiply it by the area of the plate. Okay, so we take density and we multiply it by the area of the plate. And so density is typically represented by yet another Greek letter. It's called rho, okay? So it kind of looks like a P, but it's got more of like a curve going on the bottom, okay? So that's my density. And then the area of the plate is exactly what we said earlier, that integral from A to B of F of X minus G of X dx. So I'm just gonna replace that with integral from A to B of F of X minus G of X dx. All right, so that part right there represent, represents the mass of the plate, okay? We are gonna find out at the end that this row here, okay? We actually, they'll all, all the rows will always cancel out, so we won't actually have them in our answer. And to that end, I'm gonna say for this class, you don't need to include it in your actual equations as you do the work. I cannot speak for your science professors who may want you to have the row there, but I'm saying for our situation that the rows will end up canceling out. And so therefore, in all of the examples that we go through and on the quiz and on the exam, you do not need to include the row, but I want you to know that it's there because it represents the density times of, that we multiply the area by, okay? All right, so this finding the center or the mass of the plate is sort of our first step. Now, from there, we are going to go ahead and find the moments, okay? So let's change colors to find the moment in the x direction. Okay, so we're going to split this because we want to take a look at something called the moment in the x direction. And then separately, we're going to find the moment in the y direction. Okay, so we're going to find a moment in the x direction as well as a moment in the y direction. Um, I'm going to give you the letter that we used to do describe those. We'll talk about what a moment is, and then we'll fill in the rest of the formula. Okay, so the moment in the x direction is represented by m sub x. I know that's probably a little confusing because we just use m for the mass of the plate, but m sub x represents the moment in direction x. That means that to find the moment in the y direction, we would call that m sub y, OK? 
Okay. So what is a moment? A moment is nothing more than the tendency of a region to rotate about whatever axis we're looking at. Uh, you could think about it like the tendency to kind of almost be off balance in a certain direction, all right? So if we find M sub X, we're finding out how likely is it that the region is going to rotate about the X axis. And when we find M sub Y, we are finding how likely is it that the region is going to rotate about the Y axis. So that's what our M sub X and our M sub Y stand for. Now the formulas for these also include rho, okay? And we're gonna include them here. I'll highlight it again, but again, because they cancel out, I'm not for this class going to require that you have the rho in there, okay? So the formula to find the moment in the x direction is rho times the integral from A to B of one half F of X squared minus G of X squared DF. The moment in the Y direction is represented by this formula, rho, the integral from A to B of x times f of x minus g of x dx, okay? All right, so we've got our mass of the plate represented by that equation above. We've got our moment in the x direction and our moment in the y direction, and we'll notice that they all have a row in them. Now to find the center of mass or the centroid, that's what this last set of boxes is. So if we want to find the center of mass, okay, so the center of mass, we need the center in the x direction and we need the center in the y direction. And so we're gonna call the center in the x direction to be x bar. Okay. And the center in the y direction, we're going to call that y bar. And so when we find x bar, that only gives us the x center, or the center in the x direction. And when we find y bar, that only gives us the center in the y direction. So we need to find both so that we have a point that we can then plot. Okay. So the good news is that all this work above really sets us up to find our x bar and our y bar. So our x bar is equal to the moment in the y direction divided by the center, uh, the mass of the plate, okay? We can think about this if we plug in those formulas that we had from above, that we're going to have rho, the integral from A to B of x, f of x minus g of x dx over rho, the integral from A to B of f of x minus g of x dx. Now, I think at this point, it's pretty obvious why the rows are not in our final answer because we've got a constant of rho here we've also got a constant of rho down here, okay? So the rest of this equation that didn't get crossed out in the red is really what we're gonna use to find our x bar. Um, what's the difference between the numerator and the denominator, by the way? The x. Yeah, one of them multiplies by the x, the other one doesn't. So there's not anything you can reduce before you take your integral. Okay, so just be really careful about that. Now, to find y bar, we take the moment in the x direction and we divide it by the mass of the plate. And so I'm not gonna write the rows this time because I think we see from x bar that they cancel out. 
but rather we'll end up with the integral from A to B. You're welcome to bring the one half out to the front um, if you want to, or you can keep it on the inside if you want to. Uh, F of x squared minus g of x squared goes in the numerator, and then the denominator is just the integral from a to b of f of x minus g of x. Okay. All right. Any questions so far on the formulas that we've seen? So <clears throat> this section is definitely a little shorter. I think we only have two examples in here to go through, okay? So we're gonna take a look at example one where we find the centroid bounded by this region. And then we'll take a look at example two where we find the centroid of a general region, okay? So we'll be working more with variables in example two and more with numbers in example one, okay? And that's Would you mind it. Just scrolling up just for a second I'm sorry oh of course yeah cool thank you I just wanted to see I, I messed up on the center of X thanks yeah no worries um, okay so let's get started with example number one okay and I'm gonna have us kind of sketch a diagram for example number one just so we can kind of visualize the space that we're using okay so we've got an x, y axis, because we're back in rectangular. Uh, let's do y equals six minus x squared in green. Um, so if we were to do describe that shape, I hope we know it's a parabola. I hope we know it's facing down, and it has a y-intercept of zero comma six, okay? So those parts should be pretty easy for us to identify at this point in our math careers, okay? Um, if we want to find, sketch our y equals three minus two x, we know that's a line. We know it has a y-intercept of three and a slope of negative two, so that might look something kind of like this. Okay. Now, if I don't have coordinates of intersections that are given to me, then I need to find them. Okay, so we need to find this point and we also need to find this point. So how do we go about doing that? Set them equal to each other. Set them equal to each other. All right, so six minus X squared equals three minus two X. Um, so I'm gonna get Let's see, zero equals x squared minus two x, three minus six is minus three. And so I know I can factor and I get x minus three and x <clears throat> plus one. And so I know that the x values of the intersections are negative one and positive three. Now, I could find the y values if I wanted to, but I'm looking at my formulas from the previous page, and I know I only need the x values of my bounds if I'm gonna be finding these, because I'm all I'm doing is integrating with respect to x. So I only need to know what my a and b are. I don't need to know the y values that go with them. Okay. All right. So from here, let's go ahead and find our x bar, and then we'll go ahead and find our y bar, okay? So to find our x bar, we need to find the moment in the y direction and divide it by the mass of the plate, okay? And in this case, our quote unquote plate is sort of like this region in here, okay? And so we can set up both integrals 
um, I know on the bottom, I'm going to just find the area, right? So from negative one to three of which one's my top curve? Six minus x squared. Good, six minus x squared and then minus three minus two x. That'll get me the area of the function, which is part of what contributes to the mass of the plate. Now, on the, in the numerator, I'm going to have the integral from negative 1 to 3. But this time, I have an x in there, and I multiply it by my 6 minus x squared minus 3 minus 2x dx. Okay. So that's sort of like our basic setup. This looks pretty complicated, but as soon as we distribute some signs and combine some like terms, I think it actually cleans up quite nice. So on the bottom, if I combine some like terms, the six and the three give me three uh, minus or plus two x minus x squared dx. And if I simplify the integral on the top, I actually get the same thing, except I have to multiply that expression by an x. So instead of 3, I get 3x. Instead of 2x, I get 2x squared. Instead of x squared, I get x cubed. All right, so the good news is with our integral, the only rules we need are power rule. That's it. We don't have any like trig subs or anything like that. We don't even have any u subs. It's just power rule. Back to the basics, okay? So let's integrate the numerator. And let's integrate the denominator. Okay. And so now we're going to plug everything in. And I don't have any zeros, so I can't really shortcut it and just say, like, oh, I know I'm only going to plug in this one number. I actually have to plug in both numbers. So when I plug the three into the numerator, oops, when I plug the three into the numerator, this should be three x squared, um, I end up with 27 over three plus 27 times two is 54 over three, sorry, that's a two, minus 3 to the 4th is 81 over 4. Okay, And now I have to subtract what happens if I plug in negative 1. So we really need to be careful about our signs here. All right. So when I plug in negative 1, I'm going to get 3 halves minus 2 thirds minus 1 fourth. And let's do the same thing in our denominator. So 3 times 3 gives me 9 plus 9 minus 27 over 3 minus negative 3 plus 1 minus plus 1 third. Okay. All right. So instead of trying to combine everything into like one fraction right off the bat, um, what I like to do is sort of combine my like terms. So for example, this 27 over two minus the three over two, like I'll combine those. And then I'll combine the fractions that have a three in the denominator and then combine fractions that have a four in the denominator, okay? And I'm telling you all of this not to be like, ooh, I'm so fancy, but I'm telling you this so that when you're trying to deal with maybe larger numbers or things that where you don't have a calculator, that it's easier than brute force and just kind of trying to like multiply all these numbers out, okay? 
So for the first set, we'll get 24 over 2. For the second set, we will get 56 over 3, and then we get minus 80 over 4. And in the bottom, I really only have two kinds of numbers. I have my whole numbers and my things that are with a one third. So that'll give me 20 minus 28 over 3. You combine all your fractions to have a common denominator. Uh, for the top, I would probably go with 12, and for the bottom, I would go with 3. So on the bottom, we're going to end up with 32 over 3. Okay, and I'll leave this to you to to um, figure out like the small steps in between. But if we have a common denominator of 12. All right, we should have 128 as our numerator. And let's think about if we can reduce anything. So these two I could reduce by six, that would, or by four, that would give me three. And this would actually give me 32. And so at the end, I have 32 over three divided by 32 over three. That's going to give us one for our x bar, okay? So I don't think the formula is necessarily hard, but I think being careful about showing all of your computations in between might be a place where we just need to shore up our calculations a little bit, okay? Uh, any questions about finding x bar? Right. So I'm actually going to put y bar on the following, um, I'm going to put y bar on the second half here and then we'll just kind of bump this question to the, to the second half. Okay, so y bar is going to be the moment around the x-axis over the mass, right? Now, if you've already found the mass from your previous problem, you are 100% welcome to go ahead and put that right there, okay? Once you've done the calculations once, you don't need to do it again. You do, however, have to find your moment around the x, okay? So I'll give you guys a few moments to kind of set that up and start simplifying and start integrating, and then we'll, we'll take a look at our answers and our work and see how that goes, okay? So start setting up that numerator to find our y bar. All right, so if I just start writing the formula here for my moment around the x direction, I know I have the one half, negative one to three of, now this is where I need to make sure that I do all that I need to do. I need to take my first function. I need to make sure I square it, meaning I have to FOIL and then minus the second function, squared dx. So this gives us a much larger part two 
but we have our 1 half, negative 1 to 3. And let's see, we've got 36 minus 12x squared minus plus x to the 4, okay? Minus 9 minus 12x plus 4x squared dx. So in the next line, I'm going to go ahead and combine my like terms before I integrate. And that's going to give me 27 plus 12x minus 16x squared plus x to the fourth dx. Is that what folks are getting when they FOIL out and combine like terms? Yes. Yeah? Okay. All right. So now we need to remember we need to integrate. We can't just plug in our bounds, right? So when we integrate, our numerator becomes 27x plus 6x squared minus 16x cubed over 3 plus x to the fifth over 5 and I'm plugging in 3 and negative 1 and I'm dividing that by 32 over 3. Okay. So at this stage I'm going to go ahead and change 32 over 3 in the denominator to be 3 over 32 times whatever I'm going to get. Okay, so 3 over 32, and now I can plug in my bounds. So 27 times 3 is 81, plus 6 times 9 is 54, minus 3 cubed is 27. But if I were... Yes? Would that 32 change to a 64? Would the 32... When you brought the fraction up to the top. Why would it change to a 64? One half. Did you multiply by the one half? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. the one half. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did not multiply by the one half. I'm oh, sorry. No, you're fine. Okay, so three over 64. Yeah, there we go. Okay, um, so then if I were doing this by hand, I'd maybe do like 16 times 3 times 3 times 3 over 3, just so I know I could cancel one of those 3s out, okay? Um, plus 3 to the fifth is 243 over 5. Then now I have to plug in negative 1. So negative 27 plus 6 plus 16 thirds minus 1 fifth. So it's a 1, it's not a 0, but it still made my life a little bit easier. OK. So we've got our proper constant right now, 3 over 64. Thank you for catching that. And let's see what we can combine. 81, 54, 27, and 6. Um, what does that give us? Let's see, 81 plus 54 plus 27 minus 6 is going to give me 156 for all the numbers, or whole numbers, rather. Mm, minus, let's see, maybe I don't want to get rid of those three so I have a common fraction. Uh, 16 times 9 uh, times 3 gives me 432 and then I'm subtracting another 16. So I get 448 over 3 and then plus 244 over 5. Okay. And we should end up with a common denominator of 15, all right? And so if we have 15 as our common denominator, we end up with a numerator of 832. So 3 times 
832 over 64 times 15. And that should reduce quite a bit here. And it should bring us all the way down to 13 in our numerator over 5 in our denominator. And this is probably where we get the five, and I bet those cancel and you get a 13. All right, so finding your X bar and your Y bar, not necessarily technically difficult, just a kind of a lot of fractions to kind of take care of when you're evaluating that, okay? Uh, in terms of your final answer, it says find the centroid. So you want to represent your answer as a coordinate. It'll be one comma 13 fifths, okay? So your centroid is one comma 13 fifths. And if we graph that, like go back to our original picture, and say, hey, where is 1 comma 13 over 5? I know 1 is like around here somewhere. 13.5 is about 2.6. So like about here would be the middle of this shape in terms of the area. OK? All right, any questions on example 1? Um, I know it's 1030. I would like to do example two just so we can kind of wrap this up before break if that's okay with folks. Okay. And that way we can kind of start fresh with uh, 6.8 when we come back from break. So on that note, let's take a look at example number two. Example number two says find the centroid of the semicircular region bounded by the x axis and the graph of y equals a squared minus x squared with a greater than zero. All right, so let's sketch a diagram of this. If I have a semicircle that is a squared minus x squared, that means that my graph is gonna look something like this where this is going to be negative a and this is going to be a. And so our goal here is to find the center of mass of the semicircle, okay? And so let's go ahead and set up for our x bar, all right? So x bar we know is m sub y over m. And just to review those formulas, Right, we've got our integral from a to b of x times f of x minus g of x dx. And on the bottom, we have the integral from a to b of f of x minus g of x. Okay, so um, a couple questions for you. My f of x in this case, what is f of x? It would be the square root of a squared minus x squared. Yeah, f of x is the square root of a squared minus x squared. Okay. What is my g of x? y is equal to zero. Yeah, it's actually zero because that talks about this line right here, which is our x-axis, okay? So sometimes we have two very clear curves like we did in example one, but sometimes that second curve is kind of hidden because it's actually just the x-axis. So in that case, we don't have our um, a g of x because that's zero, so it goes away, okay? Now, if we were to set up our integral, we would go from the integral from negative a to a of x, times the square root of a squared minus x squared. And on the bottom, I'd have my integral from negative a to a of square root of a squared minus x squared. 
Now, what technique would I use to integrate the numerator? U sub. Yeah, we would do U sub on that. And that's something that I don't know how it feels like on your end as students, because I think we've learned a whole lot in our five weeks together. But that is something that most of us are very confident in making that decision right now. And I can tell you that not all students feel that way in Calc 2. So the fact that you can make these decisions is actually really, really indicative of the time and effort that you've put in. Okay, so I know that's sometimes easy to forget. But just as a reminder from the teacher end, like I emphasize it because not all students get it. So if you're like, oh, well, of course I get it because she said it like 20 times, you are actually internalizing a lot of those decisions decisions and that's really awesome okay um strategy for the denominator Jigsaw. what's that Jigsaw. Um, yeah exactly and more specifically we're going to use sign right okay so this one is going to be a trig sum and specifically it's going to be the sine theta one okay maybe we could even say a sine theta now we could go ahead and work through all of this, but let me ask you guys a question going back to the picture. Where is the center of the X part of your graph? Zero. Zero, how do you know that? Symmetry. Symmetry, exactly, okay? So you could go through all of this, but at the end, what you would get is you would get zero. Okay, and you would get zero because the region is symmetric about that y axis. Okay, meaning the left half and the right half perfectly balance each other, so the middle point for the x is zero. Okay. Now with the Y one, it's not is that always okay. What's that? I was asking, is that always gonna be the case with regions that are symmetric? If if it's the direction that it's symmetric in, then the X bar or the Y bar will be zero. Okay, thank you. And that's really if you're thinking about it being centered at the origin. So if I shift this circle over like five units to the right, what's my X bar going to be? A positive value. Be more specific. Wouldn't it be 2.5 in that case? No, I'm going to take the whole thing and move everything over five. All of it would be, um, well, there's a chance that all of it would be on the right side of the y-axis. Right, but I'm asking where the x center is. It would be five. It would be at five, right? So I'm saying it's zero because it happens to be centered at zero. But if I move everything to the right five, then my center for the X is going to be at five. So it's wherever the center of that shape is. And so if I move it to the left 10 units, then my center would be at negative 10. Does that make sense, Leo? That makes sense, thank you. Okay. All right. So now the Y bar though, we can't necessarily shortcut. Okay, so we, let's go ahead and set this up in the equation, but I can visually tell that I can't just go halfway in between the top and the bottom because there's a little bit more area on the bottom. So it kind of like counts for more and the top part of the circle counts a little bit less because there's less area, okay? So let's make sure I don't drop the one half this time, but we've got one half the integral from negative a to a of the function f of x, but I square it. So a squared minus x squared dx. Now I could set up an area or the integral for the bottom half as well. 
all right? So I could definitely do that just like I did over here and we would have to use a trig sub uh, to answer that. But let's be a little bit more clever, okay? The shape that I have is a semicircle and I know the area formula for a semicircle, right? It's just the circle formula, but cut in half. So the area of the shape that I have is one half pi a squared. Now again, you could put the same denominator we had from the x bar, but in order to evaluate that, you would need trig sub. So there's nothing wrong with that, but it will take you a lot longer to solve than it will if you can see that it's an area and you know that formula, okay? Now I can go ahead and reduce a bunch of things. So this one half and that one half go away. And so I have on the bottom pi a squared. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and integrate. So I've got a squared x minus x cubed over three. And I'm gonna go ahead and evaluate from a to negative a. And if you wanted to use symmetry here in the numerator, you're more than welcome to do that, okay? Uh, and now we're gonna plug in a and negative a. So we've got a cubed minus a cubed over three minus negative a cubed plus a cubed over three. And then we have pi a squared in the denominator. And this is nice because we end up with a cubed and another a cubed. So we have two a cubed. And then we have minus two a cubed over three over pi a squared. Mm, if we clean up the numerator a little bit and have a common denominator of three, that will give us six a cubed minus two a cubed, which is four a cubed. And now let's clean this up even more. Four a cubed over three times, what am I gonna multiply by here? The reciprocal. Which is? One over a, a pi a squared. But one over pi a squared. Okay, so now let's see what cancels out. Well, this cubed and that squared means that there's no more a's in the denominator and we end up with four a over three pi as our y bar, okay? Now together, that means that the center of mass is going to be at zero comma four a over three pi. And so what we found is the general formula for the centroid of a semicircle, no matter what the radius is. So if the radius is three, you just plug in three. If the radius is 10, you just plug in 10. If the radius is 100, you just plug in 100 for A, okay? If the diameter is 100 though, you'd plug in 50 for A, okay? So I hope that was, um, I know it was only two examples, but again, a lot of this is very, like we're just going off the formula. So hopefully the quiz will give you a little extra practice in uh, working through these. Um, I do wanna say a few things about this, which is I like to put it all into the equation at once, but for some folks, maybe that's too busy or it's too much. So, I have, you know, like it's fine if you wanna find your m first, right? Do the work for the m. Do the work for the m sub x, do the work for the m sub y, and then divide your answers accordingly. Like that's also another way of looking at it and there's nothing wrong with it, okay? I think my hope in having us do everything in that one equation was kind of just like getting us used to seeing really long equations but still feeling confident enough to work through them. 
that makes sense. Um, so you can find M, M sub X, M sub Y separately, and that will still get you the same answers as long as you divide the right things at the end. All right, so I'm gonna stop the video there.